For those of you looking forward to submitting an increase, here's what you need to consider and do not sleep on this. Everyone is talking about these mental health changes, which do seem to be favorable and the main conversation around this are veterans submitting for an increase once these changes go into effect. And this is a topic we absolutely need to talk about so you are aware of what that entails, both the pros and the cons. This is what you need to start doing right now, today. The first thing is gather your evidence. Now, technically speaking, you do not need evidence to submit an increase, but if you submit a claim without evidence, specifically for an increase, you are at the mercy of the CNP examiner. And we all know that there are good examiners and then there are not so good examiners. So you can pretty much decide to submit your claim with or without evidence, completely your choice. We recommend you always submit an evidence-based claim, especially for an increase. So what does gathering evidence for an increase actually look like? It's pretty simple. You either take advantage of VA healthcare or you use private insurance to speak with your healthcare team and be referred to a mental health specialist if you aren't already. That would look like a psychologist or a psychiatrist, a social worker, whatever that looks like for you. That would eventually turn into a treatment plan. And during these appointments, you continue to mention your symptoms. And of note, the VA have given us the cheat sheet as to how they are going to rate mental health. The current or soon to be prior schedule rating for mental health kind of look like a hodgepodge of symptoms clumped together on one pile and just kind of thrown in Title 38 of the CFR. The new or proposed mental health ratings is very mathematical and in my opinion, it's more of an objective approach when awarding a rating versus subjective. So what I mean by that is if you were if you have symptoms at 70% but you're rated 50% on your decision letter, it will probably say something like veteran most closely associates with 50%. This new or proposed mental health rating change is more mathematical to where depending on how many domains you rate, you are X percentage. So in my opinion, it's very, it's more objective versus subjective, which is an absolute win for veterans. So let's go ahead and dive into what this new rating schedule is proposed to look like so that way you can articulate in a manner that the VA understands, okay? And what we are articulating are our symptoms. So here we go. This is the schedule of ratings for the proposed mental health. And I'm gonna have this link pinned in the comments so you can see this for yourself. Now you can see that we're, we're pretty far along uh, down the pipe here and so you're going to have to scroll all the way down to actually find the domains but let's talk about these domains and how ratings or, or how mental health is going to be rated there are five domains okay five domains and as you can see depending on how many domains and what level in each domain you are in you will have your rating so for a hundred percent va disability rating for mental health alone, you need to be level four in one or more domains or level three in two or more domains. And then you can see for 70%, it's level three in one and level two in two or more. Level two is um, in one or 50% is level two in one domain. And then 30 is level one in two or more domains. And then 10 is the minimum rating. So they have striked the 0% um, rating for mental health. Let's talk about these domains first. Okay. There are five domains. One is cognition. And each domain kind of gives a brief definition or what the VA is looking for when it comes to cognition. Right. So for the first domain, cognition may include but not limited to so there's more but it's really associated with like the the tbi symptoms right memory concentration attention goal setting speed of processing information planning organizing prioritizing problem solving judgment making decisions 
or flexibility in adapting when appropriate. So this screams TBI in my opinion, but that is what the first domain is. And we're going to cover what the levels mean here, here in a sec. The second domain is interpersonal interactions and relationships. And so includes both informal and formal, right? So if you struggle with um, connecting emotionally with your family, your spouse, your children, where that lo looks like, that would fall into here. And then as well as just so 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 socially, what does your friendships look like um, within the workplace, outside the workplace? Do you get along with uh, other people? Can you hold a conversation? Are you super awkward? Um, things like that. And number three, the third domain is task completion and life activities. So it may include, but not limited to the following types, vocational, educational, domestic, social, or care caregiving. The fourth domain is navigating environments. May include, but not limited to the following, um, leaving the home, being in confined or crowded spaces, independently moving in surroundings, navigating new environments, driving, or using public transportation. So it kind of screams caregiver almost, okay? And then the fifth domain is self-care, a very, very prevalent um, symptom for veterans, specifically with mental health, and that is um, hygiene, dressing appropriately, or taking nourishment, right? So showering, what does what, what does your hygiene routine look, look like? Is your hair messed up? Are you clean shaven? Is your beard shaped up? Things like that, right? Are you wearing pajamas everywhere you go? Um, that's what the VA is looking for. Let's go ahead and scroll back up to where the levels are. So there are four levels and level zero is none. Level one is mild, two is moderate, three is severe, and four is total impairment. And all of these have a metric base, right? So we see mild is less than a quarter of the time. Moderate is 25% or more of the time. So a qu quarter or more, um, or severe impairment that occurs less than 25% of the time. Here's severe, which is a quarter or more of the time or total impairment that incurs less than 25% of the time. So they're kind of making a bridge from zero all the way to four and four being total impairment that incurs 25% or more of the time. And these levels are the same exact one for each domain. They're the same that de that de definitions. Now in the criteria portion of how mental health is rated. Okay. What you're going to see is cognition. So let's start with cognition and it it tells you sort of a short definition of what this level of level one mild would look like for cognition. So it says slight difficulties in one of, or more aspects of cognitive fun functioning. So we see aspects of cognitive functioning here and this goes back to the definition, right? Memory, concentration, yada, 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 all of that. And then you keep scrolling down to moderate clinically significant difficulties i like how they added clin clinically here because it implies the need for medical evidence right not just your testimony but medical evidence which is really what this video is all about then we have severe serious difficulties in one or more and then total which is profound difficulties in one or more and the criteria is almost the same for these except for um, for instance, the second domain, it will say slight difficulties in the new domain. So it's almost copy pasted. I think this proposed criteria for mental health is one more understandable to the common veteran. And two, it doesn't list out a bunch of sy symptoms like the prior schedule ratings does. And so what that means is veterans have to really look inward and say, hey, how is this affecting my life? And then communicate that, this part's key, communicate that to your healthcare team because we as informed and educated veterans absolutely every single time, no matter what, submit an evidence-based claim. And if you don't do that, you're at the mercy of the CMP examiner. Now, I know someone's going to say, well, I submitted all the evidence and I was still denied. 
if that's the case and you submitted hard evidence and good evidence, veterans can lean and rely on evidence. That is when higher level reviews come in clutch. You are not able to do an HLR if you do not have the evidence because the Raider can't change that decision not based on evidence, all right? Stop doing what you're doing. Talk to your healthcare team. Be smart about it, okay? Be smart about talking to your healthcare team and submit an evidence-based claim.